hi, everybody. I, I, as Lois said, I'm Lori Dyshen at Lawrence Livermore. I've been involved with high performance computing and numerical methods for my entire career. Um, and so I'm here to give the overview and introductory remarks for the rest of the day. And I'd like to start by understanding exactly who, who our team is talking to. So could you let me know if your background is more on the applied math computational science side? Okay, and then more on the computer science? Okay, and there are some folks who have not raised their hand. That's not 100%. What are the rest of you? <laughs> so, so, so this is a, a very high level introductory type talk. It should be appropriate uh, for folks in computer science and it'll start to introduce some of the more complicated topics that we'll be getting into through, through the rest of the day for those who are more on the applied math computational side of things. So just as a reminder, what we're attempting to do today is to take you through and give you an introduction to understand some of the applied mathematics that go into solving computational science applications. Provide an overview of the software tools and algorithms that we're using to solve those problems and then give you some practice throughout the day through the hands-on sessions that should be integrated together in with the lectures as, as we go through. So, so this presentation, as I said, is a very high level introduction. And I want to talk a little bit about why it's important uh, for you to listen to me, independent of your background. So first of all, I want to talk about how HPC numerical software addresses the challenges that are coming up in computational science today. And those challenges arise for a variety of reasons. One, because we're increasingly able to solve more and more complex physical systems. And second, because the architectures are undergoing a revolutionary change, which are making it more difficult to address these challenges. Increasingly, we're working as a community to drive toward an ecosystem of numerical software. And that's what you'll see today. It's the uh, effects of many, many years of concerted effort by these teams to drive towards a more integrated e ecosystem. And then for you, we'll conclude with some information about what's available for to use in ter terms of the software. Where do you go to get more information? So the reason this is important uh, for you is libraries, the numerical software that we're talking about is often encoded in, into frameworks or libraries that can be reused uh, across a broad range of different applications. And so it's developed by experts, people who spend their entire careers focused, for example, on the kinds of things that Jack was talking about. How do you get the very best performance out of matrix matrix uh, multiplications or out of unstructured grid discretization technologies? How do you get the very best out of that? So you want to be able to exploit that and use that in your applications. Um, in addition, there's a lot of complexity both in the software that we're developing because of the architectures as they're changing, and, the, and again, in the kinds of applications we can address. And you want to be able to, to take advantage of uh, and cope with that complexity rather than if you're an application scientist, developing it yourself. If you're a computer scientist in the room, just so you know, why this is important for you is our group is often your early adopters. You're developing new tools for high performance computing, how to get the best out of those machines. Uh, numerical libraries folks, uh, numerical software, we tend to be very good early adopters of those tools and it allows you to deploy those software techniques in a very uh, broad way. So as Lois mentioned, this work is uh, based on work that's happened over the last actually decade, 15 years uh, in the SIDAC program. Uh, most recently, we were instantiated as the Fast Math Institute, which was a collection of uh, five different laboratories and six universities, about 40 PIs, working on a broad range of computational science libraries and tools. Uh, the ideas, scientific software productivity, they have been largely focused on best practices for software engineering and improving the interoperability among the different software technologies that you'll be uh, hearing about today. And you'll be able to, uh, I think Barry's giving a talk right before dinner on some of the tools that have come out of this effort uh, to help with that interoperability. interoperability. And of course the Exascale Computing Project. So this is a now a very large effort funded by the Department of Energy, joint between the Office of Science and NNSA, that's really focused on driving and accelerating exascale computing and making that a reality sooner than it otherwise would have been. So the things that are really driving and pushing 
extreme scale computing is the fact that we now have the computational power to solve ever increasing complex physical applications. So back in 2011, there was a workshop that was organized by some of the key presenters, including Lois, for example, Mark Shepard, who you'll be hearing from later today, David Keyes, who you heard from earlier this week, or last week, um, that focused on what are the challenges and opportunities associated with multi-physics applications, where you're putting together different kinds of physics to increase the fidelity or accuracy by which you're representing physical phenomenon. And there were a number of things that came out of that, and it's mostly focused on this really nice quote by Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, who looked at, you know, we often think that when we have completed our study of one, we know all about two, because two is one and one. And we often forget that we still have to make a study of and. And I think that's really true when you're starting to think about multi-physics applications. So when you think about that, you've got different physical phenomenon that are happening on very different time scales, potentially very different physical scales, uh, spatial scales. So how do you get those things to work together in, the, in a way that is consistent, in a way that is accurate and stable? And so these are the kinds of challenges that you start to face when you're putting different physical uh, processes together. How do you do error estimation in those cases so you understand how much error is in one part of the simulation? How do you transfer that error between different parts of the simulation? So there are lots and lots of interesting challenges that arise when you start to think about the and of multi-physics, multi-rate, multi-scale uh, applications. And those are the kinds of things that are driving extreme scale computing today. So software is really the practical way that you get at modeling and simulation of these multi-physics phenomenon. So right now, uh, today, we have enough computational power that we really can enable these multi-physics, multi-scale, multi-component applications. We're able to do much more uncertainty quantification, understanding the error, error. what's the range of, of uncertainty, what do we know for sure about the simulation that we just ran. Uh, simulations involving stochastic quantities, doing statistical runs and understanding those processes, doing design, answering questions, what is the best solution for my problem? And we, we're really moving from using simulation to understand what just happened in that experiment, for example. The interpretive use of simulation to understand really what did we just see, moving it increasingly toward what can we predict going forward? What's the best experiment to run next, right? Not what did we just see, but what's the best thing to do next? And those are the kinds of exciting opportunities that we have now as we move you know, through petascale and into exascale computing. But the way to get productivity is to reduce the number of lines of code that any given programmer has to write, be it a numerical library software developer, we wanna take advantage of the computer science tools that people are developing. Application scientists wanna take advantage of the numerical libraries. And so again, there's a, a big ecosystem of software, scientific software development that is happening today that allows applications to be developed much more effectively and efficiently and allows us to get more science done. So when you think about the computational science and engineering loop, there are several steps that you go through. And at a very, very high level, and we'll, we'll do a very introductory example. So for those of you who are applied mathematicians and computational scientists, I give you the next six slides to you know, read your email or something. <laughs> so, but for those of you who are computer scientists who may not have seen this, at a very, very high level, the very first thing we need to do in modeling a physical application is understanding what is that mathematical model? What is the description of the physics that's going on? And can we express that in mathematics? And so once you have that mathematical model, generally speaking, it's too complicated to solve analytically. And so you go ahead and you, you approximate that model using discretization technologies. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. What are the different kinds of discretization technologies that you can use? And there's discretization technologies that you apply to the spatial domain, to the geometry of the, of the problem that you're trying to solve, to the, to the equations that you're trying, trying to solve, to the temporal scales. Lots of different discretization technologies. This results in large-scale linear systems 
that you can solve using a variety of different techniques, which we'll talk about. You'll want to understand the error in your solution. You'll need to refine that and perhaps iterate through that in a number of times. And this involves lots and lots of different kinds of software, ranging from mesh generation tools to once you have a very large scale mesh, it's probably not going to fit on a single processor of your computer, so you're going to have to chop that problem up in some way. How do you do that in the most effective way to, to minimize the data movement that Jack was talking about earlier? Uh, increasingly, you can also reduce data movement by looking at higher order discretizations. They're much more effective on today's architectures. So again, moving from low order to high order, linear, nonlinear solvers, eigen solvers, mesh refinement libraries, error indicators, uh, coupling methods, all of this kind of complexity is just in the, the primary simulation loop for computational science and engineering. And then when you want to move towards that predictive simulation that I talked about, when you want to do more complicated analysis, uncertainty quantification, optimization design, it gets even more complicated. That becomes just one step in a larger loop where you're looking at things like sensitivities and derivatives for all these very complex processes and, and software components that you have. Uh, looking at how error is propagating through the different physics. Doing data analytics on these very large scale problems is a very challenging problem. Um, and then this, in addition, requires even more software. Software that allows you to compute adjoints and sensitivities, uh, looking at algorithmic differentiation. If you can't do it analytically, how do you do it uh, from the perspective of software? Ensemble simulations. So now that one CSE simulation loop that is, used to be a hero challenge problem is now taking place over and over and over again and you want to solve thousands of those. How can you do that effectively? Can you use reduced order modeling uh, to make accurate simulations uh, much faster? Uh, optimization codes uh, so that you can look at design type problems. So it's a very complex problem. So to break it down, I'm going to take you back to your introductory numerical methods class. Uh, for those of you who are computer science, this is uh, numerical methods 101. So consider, consider a one dimensional rod and it's got two ends. One end is in a hot water bath, the other end is in a cold water bath. And what happens to that rod over time? Well, the heat from the hot water bath diffuses through the rod and uh, the cold water bath, and you'll end up with a, a very linear representation of temperature along that one dimensional rod. So how is that represented mathematically? Well, it turns out it's represented with this diffusion operator, a Laplacian, uh, this upside down triangle squared. T is going to be our temperature in this case, and the equation is, you know, the, the differential, you know, Laplacian, uh, of t is equal to zero on our domain, omega. At t equals zero, we have a hot water bath of 180 degrees. At t equal one, spatial one, we have a cold water bath, zero degrees. So what do we do with that? Well, intuitively, you can think about discretizing that by thinking about the fact that as the temperature is diffusing through the hot water rod, you know, any two points uh, or any point in, on that rod is going to be the average in temperature of the points on either side of that. And so you can represent that diffusion operator with this discrete equation, where again, you've got any point T sub i is going to be an average of the points on either side, and you bring in the spatial scale, the space between the points uh, as h uh, is h. And so you've got your boundary conditions, T at, at zero is 180 degrees, T at n, the nth point, is equal to zero degrees. So now that you've got your equation for each T sub i, you can go ahead and represent that as a linear system. So here is each T sub i, the ones that you don't know. Uh, your boundary conditions are represented in the right-hand side, and your coefficients for how those T sub i relate to each other are represented in this linear system. It's a tridiagonal system. It's uh, you know, the famous two minus one matrix that we all start with in numerical analysis. Uh, you can solve that using a variety of techniques. When you're done, you would visualize and analyze the results. So there you have it, solving computational science and engineering problems 101. But of course, it's not that easy, as you know, uh, when you start looking at more complex physical phenomenon. So as we're moving through and looking at 
different kinds of domains, different kinds of physics, there are different strategies that you want to use for each one of those steps that will take you through the solution process in the most effective way. So for example, when you're looking at those discretization strategies, so in our one-dimensional rod, we just had individual points that we discretized along that rod. When you're looking at two dimensions or three dimensions, you need to break that domain up into smaller little um, pieces of geometry. So little cubes, little triangles, little hexahedra, little tetrahedra. So those uh, types of grids are, are, have different characteristics. So you can think about using structured grids. So these are logically rectangular grids. They tend to be very efficient because you can just uh, loop over the grid points in a very regular way because they are structured. Uh, but there are lots of interesting challenges around, around using those kinds of grids uh, in complex geometry where you might want to use embedded boundary techniques or map multi-block techniques. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, if you have very complex domains, uh, very in interest intricate geometry, you might consider unstructured grids. These tend to be a little bit uh, more complicated to represent because those points can be anywhere. The connectivity between the cells can be much more general, but they are more flexible in the kinds of geometries that, that you represent. So uh, most problems, of course, are, are time dependent and they're nonlinear. The physical phenomena that we're studying are, are not simple diffusion equations. They're, they're much more complicated physics. So you're going to need higher algorithmic levels than just linear solves. You're going to need nonlinear solvers. Uh, multiple physical processes, we've talked about the interactions requiring careful handling and then the goal orientation for design uh, uncertainty quantification. So, so when you're thinking about block structured AMR, so I'm going to give you now a little bit of a preview for what Anne will talk about uh, next. You, you can think about using adaptive mesh refinement. So adaptive mesh refinement for structured grids has been around since the 80s. And it's a very, very nice way to focus the computation exactly where you need it. So if you've got some sort of a phenomenon that's ha happening on a smaller scale, you can put a lot more grid points in that area, and that will take that computation and refine it down to where you need it. So that's called structured adaptive mesh refinement. You can also do it with unstructured grids. And there's lots of interesting challenges to think about, particularly when you're thinking about the structured case. So here, for example, you can see you've got grids of different si grid cells of different sizes next to each other. How do you handle the boundary between a coarse grid and the fine grid in ways that are, that are accurate and consistent? How do you develop those kinds of interface uh, conditions for uh, new kinds of physics? Uh, if you've got um, time discretization, you don't want to be limited by your spatial resolution for stability in your time discretization. Perhaps you'd want to do subcycling in time in those smaller grids. So there's lots of interesting algorithmic challenges that still need to be addressed for highly efficient computations for adaptive mesh refinement and structured grids. Uh, another interesting case is looking at map multi-block methods. So this is where you've got a logically regular grid in each part of the domain, but you've chopped up the, that domain into bigger chunks and put a logically regular grid in each one of those chunks. You can use that for handling more complex geometry. You can use it for handling highly anisotropic physics. Uh, and it's a very nice technique to use, but again, at that boundary between the blocks, you can sometimes lose an order of accuracy in your overall method. So now folks are striving for very complicated physics like plasma physics, uh, plasma physics simulations to, to go toward very high order accurate map multi-block techniques so that overall the order of accuracy is, um, is acceptable. Embedded boundary methods, this is where you have a structured grid and you just cut the geometry out of the cell. So you've got a very logically regular grid everywhere, except on the boundaries where you have maybe some very small little cells that are kind of an interesting shape. So what are the algorithms that you use to handle those? What are the discretization technologies? And then finally, a multi-physics type application, particle methods, where you're mixing particles in with, with the continuum methods in the structured grid. Uh, how do you do the load balancing for that? How do you get those to interact? So these kinds of techniques, they're widely used. Anne's going to talk about them to a fair, fair extent in the next hour or so. They're applied to lots of different problems of interest to the Department of Energy, ranging from cosmology to astrophysics to fusion and accelerator modeling. So lots and lots of applications of these techniques. On the unstructured grid side, which is more my, my background, 
Uh, again, you've got a lot of interesting challenges, particularly as you're moving toward extreme scale. So parallel me mesh infrastructures, how do you make them highly efficient on machines that have millions of cores, particularly when you've got lots of memory access that you need to do to uh, manage those meshes? I already talked about dynamic load balancing. This has become a much more interesting and challenging area of research over the last several years as we get these deep memory hierarchies. Uh, where data placement is so very, very important, as, as Jack talked about. It's absolutely critical. And so our load balancing techniques are increasingly taking that into account. And we're using multi-level partitioning strategies to understand how to place not only the, the cells of the grid on the core, but also on each individual node. Again, mesh adaptation, adaptive mesh refinement in high order uh, meshes is, is very important. You can have both conforming, where all the grid points line up and the cells all match, and non-conforming, where you have some hanging nodes. You can have very high order geometries when you have unstructured grids, and that's something Sanio, who will be talking later today, works on uh, looking at highly curved elements in addition to uh, high order discretizations. The parallel performance and architecture aware implementations, Mark, I'm hoping you'll talk a little bit about some of the great work that's happened on getting these scaling to very, very large numbers of processors uh, on millions and millions of nodes. So, so as those meshes grow, so will the linear systems that we talked about. I showed the two minus one matrix earlier today. Uh, you can think about expanding that into much, much larger systems with billions of unknowns, billions and billions of unknowns. So most of these linear systems are sparse. As, as Jack mentioned earlier, they're, they're not dense. And there are lots of different things that you need to do to solve them. So you can look at direct methods. For example, Gaussian elimination is the one we learn about in your first year of numerical methods. So uh, that has a, a lot of um, important applications that still require direct methods. And Sherry Lee will be talking about some of the work in SuperLU that, that represents that. Uh, iterative methods are often commonly used. For example, Krylov methods. Uh, conjugate gradient, GM res, et cetera. Preconditioning here is, tip is typically very, very critical. So we'll talk a lot about uh, linear system solution. Ulrika will be talking about multi-level preconditioners. Barry will be talking about uh, algebraic mul uh, iterative solvers, Krylov methods, et cetera. Uh, and there's lots of software tools that exist that deliver this kind of functionality. And you'll hear again about a number of those, of those today. So the kinds of things that we have been working on over the past several years range from looking at linear system solution using direct and iterative solvers. Here we're primarily focused on uh, really what can we do to maximize performance on the machines that we're, get, that we're getting. Linear system solution is often 80, 90% of the total computational cost in solving these big large scale physics applications. So it's imperative that these techniques scale very well and perform in a highly efficient manner on the computers that we have. Uh, Nonlinear systems, uh, looking at a variety of different techniques uh, for acceleration, uh, uh, looking at homotopy techniques, looking at um, uh, fixed point acceleration methods. Carol Woodward will be talking about that a little bit later today, about nonlinear systems and, and the software and sundials. Um, eigensolvers, uh, often used in nuclear structure interactions, need a lot of linear system solution, et cetera. And then again, architecture aware implementations. So all of this software is complicated by today's architectures. Jack talked about the fact that that's very, very important. So the fundamental trends are, that we're seeing, of course, are the disruptive hardware changes that require a lot of algorithm and code refactoring, and the fact for, for coupling, because we want to be doing more multi-physics optimization type kinds of applications. So, so not only do the codes need refactoring, I would say at this point in time, they really are in a, an environment where almost continuous change is required because the architectures are changing so rapidly that we have to design our software and our software practices have to be such that the tools are gonna be readily available and highly efficient. They're gonna have to be performance portable across a wide range of different architectures. It's really kind of a renaissance in architectures right now. So we need better software architectures uh, in terms of other toolkits, libraries, and frameworks that, that we're using, and a lot of collaboration, so a lot of open source software. 
So these, this is a, a graphic that Bronisty Sapinski put together. Uh, so he's a, a computer scientist at Livermore, probably almost 10 years ago. And he was talking about the challenges that we were facing at, uh, as we approached you know, the petascale at that point. And I like to still use this because we've really kind of gone through, I would say, the first three levels of this chart in the 10 years since he first developed this graphic. Right now, we're really focused on how do we efficiently handle multi-core? This is something we've been tackling for the last five years as part of our software libraries. How do you do hybrid programming models, mixing MPI with OpenMP or uh, OpenACC? One of the things that we're facing, I think, very, very imminently is the fact that we're moving to increasingly heterogeneous architectures. And in some cases, it might be even extreme heterogeneity. So you might have different kinds of accelerators on different parts of the machine. So what does that mean for your software stack? What does that mean for your numerical algorithms? This is something that we see facing us. Um, it's coming down the pike. We're already doing a little bit when we're mixing GPUs and CPUs. That's the first step. But think about, you know, what if you had a neuromorphic board that's part of your acceleration system? It does machine learning really well, but it has a very different kind of programming model. So how, how would you take a, uh, advantage of those things and use them? And then Jack also mentioned power is increasingly important. We have to understand the power usage of our algorithms largely associated with data motion, as he mentioned. How can we adapt our algorithms to limit the amount of power that, they're being, that are being used? So we're doing research on all aspects of these things, both looking at massive concurrency across many, many different nodes, and also looking at the very deep memory hierarchies that we are facing today. And so there's lots of different techniques that you can use. And you know, the people who will be talking today are experts at this. And so I would encourage you to ask questions. If you're facing these kinds of challenges yourself in your own software development, they've got a lot of war stories that they can share. Um, many of them are, are deeply scarred <laughs> by some of these uh, war stories. And so I, during the panels, um, I would encourage you to ask those kinds of questions. Get to know them throughout the course of the day. So how do you go about reducing communication? What's the right way to do that? Uh, Jim Demmel talked about that some. But there are lots of techniques that you have to, to use, for example, in algebraic multigrid, uh, where there are techniques that have been developed. How do you increase concurrency? How do you develop algorithms that actually have more parallelism in them? Reducing those synchronization points or eliminating them. Uh, what can be done uh, around those sorts of things? And then for the deep memory hierarchies, largely we've been focused a lot on the hybrid programming models that I mentioned. How do you mix MPI uh, with OpenMP? How do you do partitioning for these deep level uh, hierarchies? How do you reuse information as much as possible using high order methods? So this is just a smattering of the research that, that we've looked at uh, and you can ask folks about. So for example, when you're talking about reducing communication, when you're looking at algebraic multigrid, so there's Galerkin operators there that are matrix matrix multiplications, which tend to introduce a lot of non-zeros. When you do a matrix matrix multiplication, you get more zeros, non-zeros in the result than you had initially. And so that can lead to more communication. And so how do you reduce that? So there are a couple of things you can do. You can just eliminate some of the non-zeros and experiment with that. You can look at different kinds of algorithms. So instead of doing multiplication, you can use additive type techniques, which maybe will converge less quickly, but have a lot less communication associated with them, and overall will run faster. So those are the kinds of things that you can look at. Um, already talked about hierarchical partitioning. So increasing concurrency. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, work, for example, in developing new eigensolver solutions that look at increased concurrency. Uh, reducing synchronization points, so using pipelining. So in, in conjugate gradient Krylov methods, if you can defer some of the renormalization re and orthogonalization steps, if you can defer that, uh, then you can reduce those synchronization points. Those are the primary places where synchronization happens in those algorithms. And you can show that you can get a significant speed up in your overall solution time, even if you just have a pipeline length of two, if you just defer it for one, one iteration. So addressing memory footprints, so doing predictive load balancing and adaptive mesh refinement so that you don't over-refine on one processor and run out of space. Uh, and then increasing the overlap between communication and computation. So 
So software libraries are, again, key for facilitating uh, computational science and engineering process. Uh, we're going to have a number of, of software libraries that are available for use that will be discussed uh, as part of the work today. So there's a lot that's available. Uh, on the slides, the ones with the yellow stars are going to be discussed as part of today's uh, exercise. So ranging from adaptive mesh refinement to linear solvers uh, on structured and unstructured grids, um, nonlinear solvers, et cetera. So lots and lots of software for you to take advantage of. This provides the links for those software, so that's available in your, in your slide deck, so you can take a look at that. So one of the things that, that Lois actually has been spearheading is putting together a gallery of, of highlight slides so that there's a, a single one-slide summary of each one of these capabilities. So I'll just walk you through one of them. Uh, and these, again, they're in your slide deck, so don't, um, I'm not going to walk you through all of them. But for example, if you look at Amorex, which is adaptive mesh refinement, some block structured adaptive mesh refinement software. So it's developed primarily at Berkeley National Lab with contributions from NREL and Argonne. And it's for block structured adaptive mesh refinement. So the little bubble near the top basically gives the primary capability of this software package. You know, what, it, what is it for? Uh, the capabilities are in the blue boxes uh, on, the, on the left. The fact that it's open source software, examples of where it's used, uh, who supported it, and then how you can get more information. And so again, there's a number of these. So for Chombo, again, a very similar type of format, hyper, you know, multi-level techniques, uh, the capabilities, and where you, where you can get access to the software. So if you have any questions about the software, many of the developers are here. And um, if you want to sign up for one-on-one -on -one time later today, I think uh, that would be a good, good use of the one-on-one -on -one time. So you can see we've got a, a number of these slides for you to, to look through. Again, where, where we're going today, we're going to focus on discretization technologies. The structured and unstructured grids that I've talked about, we'll, we'll start with that this morning. Uh, we'll break for lunch. After lunch, we'll have our a panel on heterogeneity and performance portability. How do you actually tackle that challenge of achieving performance across different architectures? Mark will moderate that panel for us. Then we'll switch into time integration, nonlinear solvers, and Krylov methods uh, for the first part of the afternoon, and then sparse direct solvers and algebraic multigrid at the uh, tail end of the afternoon. Going to introduce briefly, very briefly, some software tools and technologies that are developed for interoperability of, of the software, for building software and managing it. And then for dinner, we're going to have our second panel, which will be focused on extreme scale algorithms and, and software. Again, war stories. So ask about, you know, why are you scarred? You know, what's, <laughs> I'm going to have the audience uh, prompt you with that question, because I, I want to hear the answers to that, too. And then we'll go into some advanced topics this evening. So conforming and non-conforming adaptivity for unstructured grids and optimization using adjoint software uh, for this evening. Throughout the day, we'll be having hands-on sessions uh, associated with each package. They're designed to build upon each other and build upon a common framework and application. The lead in putting that together is Mark Miller. Um, you'll get to know him very well today. Uh, and he has done just tremendous uh, work in putting this together. So I also want to encourage you, at the end of the day, uh, in your email this morning, you got a dis uh, instructions on signing up for some one-on-one -on -one time. So as we go through the course of the day, you'll get a sense of who's here, the kinds of things that they're talking about. I gave a very high-level introduction now. If there are particular folks that you'd like to talk to in a one-on-one -on -one session, if you've got particular questions about how could you use this in your application or just whatever your question might be, I would encourage you to sign up for these one-on-one -on -one discussions with the developers. So uh, in the Google Docs, there's a, there's a link in the email. We'd like your name, institution, and email address, what your interests are, and you know, pointers to any relevant information that you might have. Certainly at the end of the day, well, we've reserved an hour for these one-on-one -on -one discussions. Uh, and others, folks will be available throughout the week, uh, different folks will be available throughout the week. And Lois, I don't know if you can say more about that. OK. OK. And then at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Mark, who's going to introduce you to the hands-on 
session so that we can get everybody up and going and so that we can have that be productive throughout the day. And then we'll, we'll loop back for questions uh, when Mark is done. So I don't know if you need this. Thank you, Lori. Um, so uh, real quick, how many people have already followed the instructions and reserved nodes and are logged into Cooley? Who, who has not done that? Okay, would you, would you start doing that now while I make some uh, adjustments? You need to explain about getting pairs. Yeah, uh, and at, at Lois reminds me also, we do, we do, it's gonna be very helpful for us, I'm sorry, before you start doing those node reservations for you to group into pairs. Um, how many people in here are, are not on either a Linux or OS X system? We have just, it looks like maybe just a few. So make sure that you pair off with someone that is. That doesn't, won't be too hard because uh, there may only be in a few. But please uh, group into pairs. It probably makes the most sense to just work with the person next to you. And one of the two pairs will do, follow the instructions and do the, the node reservation. All right, so just one of you. We're gonna do pair programming for this. One of the things that Lori talked about in the introduction was a very simple uh, heat, heat diffusion problem. So uh, that's what I think of sort of the numerical equivalent of the Hello World program. So the very first hands-on exercise we're effectively gonna do is a Hello World program for uh, this particular problem, the heat equation. Um, so if you go to the lessons page, which you should have a link to, there's a link to that in the email, you'll see the uh, lessons. Uh, and the first one we're going to go to is uh, the basic one-dimensional heat equation. And in addition to that, on Cooley, I'm, uh, this is a window I have on Cooley. Make sure I am who I think I am here. I am. Good deal. Uh, I'm actually at the root of the hands-on directory. And in there... There's, there's many exercises, it's a big tree. There's a bunch of exercises we're gonna do throughout the day. So I want you to CD to the hand heat. And you see we have the, uh, the program there, which we'll get into. I'm gonna describe the program a little bit. And, and basically what it's modeling is, is this problem. It's very similar to the one that Lori described in the intro. It's a, it's a wall, and each end of the wall is, is held at a constant temperature of zero. And uh, we're going to set an initial condition between those ends and some, some initial condition, and then watch what happens as the heat from that initial condition diffuses through the wall. Uh, that little GIF animation you see on the right is sort of uh, what's happening. There are two spikes of heat uh, that we're going to launch in this. And I'll just walk through real quickly before we actually look at the source code and actually uh, compile and run it, just sort of explain. Uh, Lori already introduced, this is the, basically the heat conduction equation. Um, and uh, what we need to ask is how do we discretize this if we actually want to write a computer program to, to model this equation. Um, so, uh, and in addition to that, for this case, because we're writing you know, I'm, I'm writing this code from scratch. In fact, I'm intentionally not using any of the numerical libraries that you uh, are working with today. And, and in order to, to write a program that can actually do something useful, I have to make it very simple. Uh, so a number of simplifying assumptions. The, uh, the wall is homogeneous there. It's just one dimensional. Um, and uh, we're basically not dealing with any heat sources. So the question is, how do we discretize this? Uh, basically, we discretize the left and right hand sides in the simple approach we're going to do here, the, the time side, that's the left hand side, and then we discretize the right hand side, which you saw this in Lori's intro, basically that same discretization. And when you do this, you come up with an update algorithm that looks like this. The temperatures at time uh, k plus 1 are completely determined by the temperatures at time k. Um, so first thing I want to ask you, is there anything that you see in, in basically these equations that are suggestive of effectively of a mesh, an underlying mesh? And, and the answer is basically the delta x's and the delta t's basically are defining a uniform mesh. So okay, let's, uh, if we look at the actual code that implements that, that's in, uh, in our program heat.c, this is the code that implements this update algorithm. This is what's known as an explicit 
uh, an explicit algorithm. And it's written all in this program, heat.c. It's about 500 lines of code here. Uh, most of the code is actually all sorts of other stuff you knew, need to do just to basically generalize it. Um, so, compiling it. We won't do a, uh, necessarily a lot of compilation today, but look at that very simple compile line. In or ordinarily, if you're using a lot of numerical packages, that compilation line can be quite complex, just getting that right. So very simple compilation line. So now we're going to run it. And in order to simplify things, since it has a number of arguments, I'll show you them. I, I sort of cheated and I made it a little make file. So the first thing, first thing we're going to do is just run the very first case, which starts off with this initial condition and a dx of uh, the spacing in x of point, let's see, what are, what are we using in x there? Point 0.1. So we'll just run this command. Uh, it ran very quickly. It uh, Basically, I've, I'm using uh, some other tools to determine the total number of floating point operations and the total amount of memory used as well. And when we run it, uh, we basically get uh, these are some different uh, calculations of the result. This is time zero, this is after 0.1 seconds, and after half a second. And you can see these spikes are already starting to diffuse out. Um, we would go to, I would try to do interactive visualization with you, but I, I, I don't want to try to do that uh, with you. I want to continue to move through this exercise. Uh, we'll have some opportunities maybe to do that later in the day. Um, but the first question we want to ask here, are the results correct? How do we know if the results are correct? And, and so the, one of the advantages of using numerical packages that have matured and been used by the community at large is very often the results from them have been vetted in very, very, different, very many ways. So when you're writing your own custom code, you sort of have to figure out how you're going to go ahead and validate those results. Um, very often when we're using numerical packages, a lot of that work's been done for us. So another question. Will we get the same results if we use different compilers and different libraries on different processors? Will we get the identically same results? Anybody believe that? No. Um, and that problem gets even worse when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of lines of, uh, of oops, I'm sorry. If, you, if you've got a very big program, this again, this is 500 lines of C code. If you've got a large set of numerical packages you're using, trying to get them to work on different compilers and different operating systems is, is a challenge. And so that work's been done for you when you're using those packages as opposed to writing custom code. So, okay, how am I doing on, on time? So it looks like I'm about halfway through. Okay, so, so um, if you look at this, this very rough calculation, what if we'd like to understand where this minimum's occurring a little bit a little bit with higher resolution. What's something we could do? What's, what's, go ahead. Discretization. Uh, finer discretization, exactly. So I want to resolve this minimum better. Let's, let's make the spacing in X a little bit smaller. We were using 0.1 here, let's use 0.01. So I'm going to call, I'm going to go make high resolution spikes here. And again, the, I'm cheating with this make file. It's got all these things already, uh, all the arguments to the function already encoded in the make file. So I ran that calculation, and, um, and the results are also there. If you list the directory here, you'll see the results from the HR spikes. And again, I've sort of, I've sort of cheated, and I've displayed some of the results for you at different time steps. Can anybody tell me what's going on with the algorithm? Anybody want to guess? Unstable. I heard someone say unstable, yes. Expli this explicit algorithm is known to be unstable for certain combinations of delta x and delta t. So, um, so it's unstable. Uh, what do you think we can do to fix the instability? Shrink delta t. Somebody already has experience with this method. Exactly. So we'll go ahead and do that. In this case, we're going to shrink delta t. It was 0.004. Now we're going to shrink it to 0 0.0001. So we'll do make HR spikes small dt. All right, ran a lot longer. And if you look at the total number of flops used, it used a lot more flops. 
but we get a much finer now, we're much more able to finally resolve this minimum that's occurring between these two peaks as it, as it diffuses. So the local minimum where you estimate it occurs now, um, I eyeballed it. We could do better than eyeballing if we wanted to, but about 0 0.56, 0 0.57. Uh, so let's see, why did this run use more memory? It used more memory. Anybody want to venture guess why? Real simple answer. Well, we changed, we changed the spacing in X, so we're, we're representing a much, much bigger mesh effectively. It's much finer, much more finely resolved mesh. So how many more flops were used? I see, I forget what the answer is here, but I think it's about 360 times. Yeah, 360 times more flops to get this answer. Okay, so just another comment. The solution changes very slowly at late time. Do we need to... Con do we need to continue using a really small time step at late time? Probably not. We're going to hear more about how we might be able to work around that problem uh, later in the day when we get to time integrators. Uh, now, the next question is, can we achieve a uh, similar solution quality with fewer flops? And the answer to that is yes, but we need to switch to an ex explicit method. I'm sorry, implicit method. We're using an explicit method here. So the last couple of runs here, we're going to use an implicit method, which means now we've got to go back and revisit this question of how we discretize the equation. Remember the first time, we just sort of took a fairly simple view, discretize the uh, right-hand side, discretize the left-hand side, and then sort of uh, uh, come up with terms. Now uh, what we're going to use is the Crank-Nicholson technique. I won't go into the derivation of the technique here, but when we discretize in this case, now the answers at the next time step are interdependent among themselves. We end up with a linear system of equations to solve at each time step. And that was actually the matrix that you saw Lori put up there. Each time we march forward in time, we have a, a matrix solve we need to do. This is called an implicit technique. So, the, so now, look at the additional code we need to implement to do this explicit technique. This is uh, doing a factor of the matrix that, um, uh, let's see, minus one, two, minus one matrix. We're doing a factoring initially of that. And then this is doing a tri-diagonal solve, this code that you see here. So now we have to go and add that to our application. All right, more code. So now let's go back and run the original problem with, uh, crank, with uh, the, the problem that failed, this problem that we had fail here because of stability issues. Let's go back and run that with Crank Nicholson now, this new discretization. So that's make HR spikes crank in here. Oops. Sorry, I copied the uh, dollar sign there too. So we let that run. And we get some results in terms, and then we can also actually, the next question is, with this algorithm, can we increase the time step and still get a, a valid answer out of it? And the answer is yes, in this case, this algorithm is unconditionally stable. So we'll use even a large DT to do it. And it runs even faster. Pay attention to the number of flops and the amount of memory used. I'll have some questions in this. So, so then the first question, why does the Crank Nicholson use more memory? Got to store the matrix. We have this A matrix we need to store now. All right. So it uses more memory. And uh, the question, one other question, is it better than the, F, uh, the forward and time centered space algorithm? The answer to that, it kind of depends. We have trade offs. I'm, and part of this exercise is to kind of demonstrate what these trade offs are. You can, you know, come up with an algorithm that goes faster and is easier to, easier to implement. For example, the first one, but it has some stability issues. That algorithm is really easy to parallelize, though. Take the Crank-Nicholson algorithm where we need to do a tridiagonal solve. Now imagine doing that in parallel across many cores. Now your code looks even more complicated because you've got to deal with parallel solves. You'll hear about, obviously, this later today as well. Um, next questions you might want to ask yourself is what if you wanted to implement it on a GPU, for example? GPUs are becoming more, more important, especially on these heterogeneous systems. Uh, so, you know, back to the reason for writing this hello world or hello numerical packages program. It introduces you to very simple, con uh, very simple uh, sort of concepts of discretizing these equations and writing code to do it. But more importantly, I want to emphasize the point, you don't want to write hand code. 
you want to actually use numerical packages that are out there to help you do these things for you because they come with a lot of advantages. We just solved a very, very simple one-dimensional problem with a homogeneous material. What if we want to go to multiple dimensions or deal with multiple materials and inhomogeneities uh, or even materials whose thermal diffusivity changes with temperature? That introduces nonlinearities to the whole problem. You know, what if we want to deal with more complex shapes other than just simple, you know, if effectively uh, computational simplexes? What if we want to deal with high levels of parallelism and all these other issues that the packages you're hearing about today are designed to deal with? So I hope I made two points. Number one, um, the basics of basically writing numerical code and dealing with it. And number two, how advantageous it is to you to think about using some of the numerical packages you're hearing about today.